Hello, my name is Karen Wells, and I'm here to talk to you today about my book. The book is called The Abortion Caravan, When Women Shut Down Government in the Battle for the Right to Choose. It's published by Second Story Press, and this is what it looks like. That's the cover for you. I'm speaking to you today from Port Hope, just east of Toronto. Um, my thanks to Glass Books in Edmonton for being part of this virtual launch, uh, something we're all now learning to do. Necessity is the mother of invention. So many thanks and uh, hello people in Edmonton. I'd like to tell you a bit about what the abortion caravan was and what it set out to do. It was a group of 17 young left women, uh, left wing women uh, in, who, who got together in the late 60s and who decided that abortion was the key issue in creating a national grassroots women's movement. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to do more uh, than only tackle the question of the abortion law. <clears throat> they figured that abortion was the issue that would unite more women. It crossed geographic lines, it crossed uh, class lines, it affected rich women and poor women. Everybody pretty well could get pregnant. Um, and it affected older women uh, who perhaps had already had their family and didn't, couldn't afford another child, and it affected young women. So abortion was an important issue. What they decided to do was to put together this caravan, 17 women riding in three different vehicles. There was a Pontiac Parisienne convertible, a great big yellow boat of a vehicle, uh, huge. There was a pickup truck with loudspeakers mounted on either side, and emblematic of the period, there was a Volkswagen van. <clears throat> and on the top of the van was a coffin. The coffin was emblematic of the numbers of women who died every year as a result of illegal abortions. Because abortion was an offense under the criminal code and doctors were prosecuted and were jailed, then women turned to the backstreet abortionists where conditions weren't hygienic, weren't clean, there were infections, um, and the other thing that they did, and, and it still happens when there's no access to legal abortion, was they aborted themselves, attempted to, um, with horrendous things. Missing needles, coat hangers, they drank Drano, lime, lime. Uh, it was all pretty awful. And they died. So that's what this coffin was all about. It was an extremely potent symbol. They put themselves in these three cars. They set off across the country. They slept on church basement floors as they went. They staged guerrilla theater in every town. They had rallies. And they always entered the town making a great deal of noise. They wanted to be noticed. They wanted to engage women. And that's what they did. By the time they got to Ottawa, they were 500 strong. They marched on government, making their demands. There was nothing subtle about it. They were demanding. Uh, they had written letters to the Prime Minister, who was then Pierre Trudeau, uh, the Justice Minister, the Health Minister. But when they got there, only four MPs came to meet them. Three of them were New Democrats. And the fourth was uh, Gerald Baldwin, a progressive conservative, a renegade from Alberta. They left Parliament Hill extremely angry, these women were. They went back to um, the school where they were staying. They'd spread their sleeping bags out on the gymnasium floor. It was a decommissioned school. And they met for 16 hours, 200 women trying to come to a decision by consensus about what they would do next. And what they decided was that they would get themselves into the galleries of the House of Commons using forged passes. They would chain themselves to their seats and they would start a speech. They'd all memorize the same speech one after another. As one was shut down by the guards, the other one would take up the speech. They did it so well, held on so long, spoke so loudly. 
that the Speaker of the House had to close down that session of Parliament for that day. <coughs> Excuse me. They were triumphant. I mean, uh, the feat of organization was quite astounding to begin with, keeping in mind there was no such thing as social media. Long distance phone calls were extremely expensive, but they had pulled this off. And the next day they were on the front page of every newspaper in the country. It's the 50th anniversary, this is history. And uh, I wanna thank a group called the Feminist History Society that has backed a series of publications telling various women's stories that have kind of slipped from our memories and are not noted in any other history of the country. And clearly, clearly, how could you not know this? A time when women shut down the House of Commons. And as the women will tell you, they got away with it in large part because nobody believed women could pull this off. They were underestimated and uh, never a good thing. So thanks to the Feminist History Society for backing this. Edmonton was an important stop along the way. The province was right at the tail end of the social credit um, period in power. Um, they came into each town, as I said, making a lot of noise, and they had contacts in every town, someone who was paving the way for them. Edmonton was interesting too because it showed that people were suspicious of them. They may well have agreed with the message, but they didn't really know who these women were. It wasn't as though they'd had a great deal of advanced publicity. They hadn't, they weren't faces on television that everybody recognized. They were just a crazy group of women making a lot of noise coming into town and people were suspicious. But let me first of all read a little section that tells you a wee bit about the woman who was their contact in Edmonton. Their Edmonton contact was Lynn Curry, a sharp young woman from North Battleford, Saskatchewan, who had grown up ironing my father's underwear. There were only two ways out of North Battleford, she said, hockey or marriage. And when her father showed signs of husband shopping on her behalf, Curry was rescued by an unlikely figure, Mother John of the Cross at the North Battleford's convent school where Lynn Curry attended, said, I've got this. And she pulled together the scholarships and grants that Lynn Curry needed to attend the University of Alberta in Edmonton. When the caravan came to town, Curry was in her final year and heading to Stanford University in California for graduate work in the fall. Like the Simon Fraser women, the students who made up the bulk of the original caravan, Lynn Curry and her friends spent a lot of time with the radical men on campus. They were interesting, they were engaging men. They were the boyfriends, the men they slept with. Here I was hanging out with all these sharp guys, she said. There was a lot of intellectual carrying on. And we'd have this great time. Then came the whole male prerogative thing. The women involved with these guys, including me, were more than willing participants. Some of them got unlucky or they weren't forceful enough about demanding condoms. Now it's down to who bears the consequences. Two of her university friends got pregnant. One wanted to have the baby, the other wanted an abortion. And Curry helped her find someone safe. She and her friends began helping other women around the university. Then later, we started running into these women who were working two jobs with three kids already. And I said, oh, for fuck's sake, this makes no sense at all. They were getting no help from anybody. They were heartbreaking stories. We can't let this happen. They set up what they call their underground railway using all the sympathetic doctor contacts they could find. They were very strict and very careful with their clients. No one went to Calgary or Saskatoon or Vancouver, wherever they could find an abortion provider alone. There was always another woman traveling with their clients in case something went wrong. A raid on a clinic or a medical problem, hemorrhage and infection were all too common. 
There were more rules. No client was allowed to take any identification, no driver's license, no credit cards, nothing that could trace her back to Edmondson and Lynn Curry. They processed over a hundred women in the two years they ran their service. The demand was so great that one weekend they needed a van with a driver. The majority of their clients were older married women who didn't always welcome 19 and 20 year olds telling them what to do. But no one ever said no. And in the two years, there have been no medical legal complications. It, it was a difficult time. Uh, the context of the time, this was the time of demonstrations against the war in Vietnam. Uh, it was also a confrontational time and a time when the RCMP, who were the National Security Force at the time, kept an eye on everybody. Um, a lot of suspicion. And the women didn't know it at the time, but they had been under surveillance since the first meeting when they began to plan this whole event. And the interesting thing is, too, that um, in 1970, there were no women RCMP officers. They were not allowed to join the force. So everybody informing on them in those meetings were snitches. They were other women writing reports for the RCMP. So Lynn Curry and everybody else was suspicious. She was prepared to help the caravan, but it was immediately apparent that several women from Vancouver were having just too much fun. She was suspicious to the point of paranoia. Not all of the Vancouver women were as politically committed. Some really came on the caravan for the adventure, at least to begin with. You could tell they were there on a lark. We didn't know whether the caravan was infiltrated because there were a lot of people we had never seen before. What struck me as the time was, damn these women have time enough to do this and I'm working two jobs to go to graduate school. Or, are you getting paid to do this? Are we infiltrated? It was not an unreasonable question. The RCMP had been watching them right from the beginning. That night in Edmonton, Lynn Curry and the women from the caravan sat together talking late into the night about where they were going next and contacts who might help them along the way. Curry played her cards close to the chest and gave away very little. The next morning, she saw them off. We banged the tables and rattled pots and pans, and I wished them Godspeed. And for the hundredth time, I was grateful of the care we took in the previous two years. And the caravan pulled out of Edmonton. Interesting, eh? Those were the times. Uh, it also turned out to be quite a good time to write this book. As most of us are aware, uh, there has been a conservative right-wing rise in the United States that has been seeking to pull back uh, some of the abortion reforms, Roe v. Wade, uh, and the changes that were made to the American law. What we found too, what has been found, is that in these times of COVID, when governments have emergency powers, in at least some states, they have been using those powers to pull back uh, those abortion rights. In the state of Texas, uh, abortion was just declared uh, a non-essential service and all abortion clinics were closed. Something similar is going on in Oklahoma and Alabama. Canada, things haven't been as bad. Abortion has been um, declared, stated as um, an essential service, a timely service. And uh, abortion clinics are staying open. There has been some difficulty in importing the abortion pill, which is increasingly used these days. It's manufactured in Europe, and there is a shortage. And as one woman, a woman who runs a clinic in St. John's, Newfoundland, said, um, we know that in times where access is severely uh, denied, women will seek to help themselves. And we're right back. To where we start. So this is a good story. There are such interesting women in here. I wondered very, I really did want to know who these women were and what it was that pushed them to do this. And each and every one of them uh, has a story to tell. So it's a good yarn, if nothing else. And it um, 
really raises the question as well as to when is the right time to color outside the lines, to take to the streets? When is that necessary and when is that justified? Thank you so much. Thank you to Glass Books in, in Edmonton. And there we are. Have a good day. Bye-bye.